My job is to talk uh, about the transportation plan and where we're going. Just as a reminder to all of you that in June, at the June 20th General Assembly, we'll be asking you to consider voting for uh, the new 2040 transportation plan. And my job tonight is to highlight some of the results of the work we've been doing and give you a sense of the emerging actions and recommendations that are going to be coming out. Uh, we didn't want to show up in June and tell you everything all at once and then say, hey, uh, vote now. In October, the, this General Assembly adopted a set of preliminary policies and guiding principles. Again, staff presented these to the Transportation Advisory Council through the Executive Committee to this, to this body to say this is the, the kind of policy and principles we think we should be using and developing the plan. And so we've been following that uh, very closely as we've moved forward. Now, part of the context of our challenge is this. Uh, we have less, much less purchasing power than, than we had before. Uh, there's not only uh, less money, but with inflation and the higher cost of projects, uh, you put all that together, you have less purchasing power. Now, this is the other, uh, uh, one of the other parts of the context before I get into some of the details. The, the, the $64,000 question, is the glass half full or half empty? And we often lose sight of the fact that, indeed, uh, we have a sophisticated system that literally supports millions of trips and millions of dollars of commerce every single day, every single day. It just happens and happens and happens. And like everything else and a lot of other things in life, we kind of just take it, take it for granted. But part of our job in doing the plan isn't to just be satisfied with that half full part of the glass. We got to say, by the very nature of the planning process, what can we do to get better to position this region for success? So, the focus of the plan is, how do we fill this glass up more? Last part of the context is this. Many of you have probably been on the internet at one point and tried to find directions somewhere or look at a map and you see this, this famous zoom bar where you know, you're looking close in to see where you're going, then you go, well, I gotta zoom out, where, where exactly is this? Um, what you see depends on where you stand. Some of the things we see when we're zoomed in, like in this intersection, are things like exactly where we are. We know exactly where we are when we're zoomed in. And we see that we can really appreciate the uniqueness of a particular site. We understand it better because we're close up. We can see it. We can see all the little idiosyncrasies that might exist at a particular place. But what we don't see is we have, if we wanted to get there, we really don't have much of a clue of how to get there. On the other hand, when we zoom out, we see different things. One of them is you can see how you can get to the place you want to go. It shows you have options. There's more than one way to get there. And some options are better than others. And here's a point I'd ask to kind of tuck away in your head as we go through the rest of this presentation, and I'll try to remind you at the end. Some options enable accomplishing a number of things. And this illustrative example, if you were just going from point A to point B, your criteria might be, how do I get there the fastest? Somebody else might say, what's the prettiest route? When we talk about where we need to go in this transportation plan and where, how we need to make that fit with other things, we have to be thinking more about what's just the quickest way. What, what paths help us do a number of things? So sometimes as we're talking about the plan both today and as we put forth the recommendations for your adoption in June, we'll be looking at the plan zoomed in. I thought this was coffee beans myself, but it, it's not. And it's, it's a beautiful center of a, of a um, daisy. So sometimes we're going to look zoomed out because we need to look in both places. So now let's talk about a couple of the measures that you adopted back in October that are guiding our work in creating success, where we adopted the critical measures that we needed to manage. One of them is, obviously, what's the system of the condition? Well, when you look from far away, you see that we have a very sophisticated, extensive road network in the region. When you get right on the ground, this is what you see all too often. And We've shown you this before, but we have to repeat it. We're under-investing. This chart here shows the deterioration of pavement condition over time. 
The last few years, thank goodness, we're studying out a little bit. But in the same time frame, the costs have more than doubled from 2004 to 2012. Because things get to a certain point, you don't just need an oil change, you gotta tear the engine out. Things get to a certain point on the road, you can't patch it, you gotta tear it out and fix it. So what we have as more of those roads go from fair to poor condition, the cost is going up. We've also talked about it's not just uh, what we spend, it's how we spend it. We looked at different ways. We took, a, we took for example, if we spend about $400 million a year on improving the pavement in the region, and we spent 10% of that on pre uh, prevention, what would happen? And the system actually declines. Currently, about 70% of the uh, system is in good condition. That would decline to 40% good or fair. Remember, the flip side of good or fair is poor. So we'd end up with 60% poor. On the other hand, if we spent 50% on prevention, the current condition would be sustained at 70% good or fair. Great news, right? And it is. Makes a big difference how we spend the money. But remember, if 70% is good or fair, 30% is poor. We often don't talk about the flip side, and this is something we have to do more and more as we have these chronic infrastructure problems that trans transcend transportation and say, what, what are we trying to achieve here? What's reasonable and at what cost? So in this example, we show the same $400 million produces a much different result. Back to what we now call O'Leary's paradox. Uh, people say we're not spending enough, but then they say it's not the amount we spend, it's how efficiently we spend it. Now you may wonder why we're asking these questions in the survey. We did this on purpose because we wanted to ask a number of questions so we could piece together information that would tell us things we need to know. And clearly we're being told people don't think we're spending enough, but they're cynical about what we're doing with what we have. Whether they're right or wrong is kind of irrelevant in a way. We have to do better at spending money efficiently. We just showed you analysis that it makes a huge difference. Now we have to communicate to the public that we're taking advantage of that knowledge. So some of the emerging messages and actions related to system condition, we have to improve efficiency to save money. If, if we don't do that, it's central to gaining support for the kind of needed changes we're gonna need for this region to compete. And success can't be our secret. We have to let people know what we're doing. And it can't be feigned or superficial. It has to be real information communicated. Let's turn to system utilization, one of our other measures. How much of what we have are we using? Before we get into this, I want to step back and take note. We travel a lot every day. I showed you that extensive network at the beginning. We travel about 113 million miles, not every year, every day, every single day. Now, I've, I used to use this stuff a lot before. For some reason, I stopped doing it. And every time I do it, especially with a crowd this big, there are going to be disbelievers in the audience. Remember, there's about 4.8 million, 4.9 million people in the region. A lot of them are drivers. Just do a little mental math about how many miles you drive on a typical day and extrapolate that out and you'll realize what we're talking about here. For perspective, that's 20 million miles. I know you might not recognize it anymore, but that's the sun. And, um, and that's about 20 million miles past the sun every day. So now let's peer in just a little bit closer. When we look at where we have congestion on our regional corridors, our major roads, we see that about 22% of it is congested either in the a.m. or in the afternoon peak period. If we go in a little bit closer and we say, where is it congested both in the morning and in the afternoon, drops down to about 7%. And if we get really close and say, where is it persistently congested, the morning, the middle of the day, and the afternoon, that's about 4% of the network. The flip side is, we're now looking at where do, might we have excess capacity. And the fact of the matter is, there's over 600 miles of roadway that could potentially be repurposed or downsized. Now we're not saying in the plan, let's get out there and you know, shrink all these roads. You know, part of the problem is 
we don't have enough money to take care of what we have if we spend money on downsizing and repurposing. That's part of the conundrum. Then we have less money to take care of what we have. On the other hand, if we keep taking care of parts of roads that we really don't need as much, then we're di uh, distracting from something else that could, or that money could be put to better use. So that's something we have to tackle as we move forward. So the emerging messages and actions on this are that we can do better. We can do better with uh, uh, utilizing the existing system. We got to take advantage of what some of the excess capacity might be used to relieve some of that congestion is one, is what, what one example. All congestion is not of equal concern because some of it is much more persistent and would be a higher priority than some of the other things. Uh, we have to place heavier emphasis on lower cost alternatives before we expand the system. And we have to be decisive about excess capacity. Um, the easy thing to do is to say, gee, it's out there, um, can't do much about it. The fact is there's a cost tied to this either way, either by action or inaction. We have to sort through what we might do uh, about some of that excess capacity. And the Detroit Future Work Study, if any of you have seen that, they're starting to con con confront that issue as one of many kinds of infrastructure in the city that, that probably uh, are going to need to be changed. And we have to explore managing demand, which we happen to just do, and I'll talk about now. Looking at Peak demand, another one of our measures. For those of you who have heard us talk about this before, we know that peak demand is a heavy driver of infrastructure costs. It doesn't matter if it's energy, water, roads, peak demand drives costs. The utilities, the energy utilities have a lot of facilities they call peaking facilities, they're there. So when the load is really heavy, when it's 100 degrees five days in a row in August or whatever, they can fire up those peaking facilities. Same on the water side. There's a lot of capacity. And most of the rate increases on the water side, if you're in the Detroit system, have been totally related to, uh, to these high fixed costs associated with peak demand. So we took a look. And let me remind you that in our official forecast that you adopted, we're going to have my, only modest growth through 2040 in both people and jobs. So we asked ourselves, how would travel change if we grow more or less? First of all, because you know, some people might say, well, don't look at travel demand issues. Well, you know, what if the forecast is wrong? So we looked at a scenario where we grew more like a Pittsburgh uh, and something that represented more like the Pittsburgh recovery. And we looked at a, a scenario where the auto industry wasn't quite as big as we predict it will be um, out in 2040. And what we found out is there isn't much change in travel either way. Doesn't make a whole big difference when you're looking out at the regional level uh, whether we grow a lot more or a lot less. It's probably not going to change any of the things I'm about to talk about. Now, let's zero in just a little bit more on our Zoom bar. Peak demand is about a fourth of the day. About six hours of the day represents peak demand in time. But if you zoom in even more, what you see is that six hours a day accounts for almost half of all the travel. Half of that 113 million miles a day is occurring in those six hours. So the picture looks different when you get closer. Now, where are we going during these peak periods? We've broken this down into two categories. How many in the room think that that green area represents work, going to work? How many people think the orange area represents going to work? OK, well, not everybody voted, so it was about a tie. When we first showed this to people, they said, oh, some people said, I know the problem. Get those people in the green off the road so we can get to work. Um, so uh, there's various explanations for this that the transportation experts can give you. I'm not going to try to do that. But it's important, again, as we're looking closer at looking at the possibility of addressing these peak periods in the congestion to understand where people are coming and going during that time. Now, for purposes of this work, we, we separated out that work category into two kinds of trips that the, that the transportation engineers and planners typically look at. There's the trips where you go straight from home to work or straight from work to home. And then there's all the other work trips where people make stops in between, do a, you know, might do a variety of things. We're looking only at the trips where we go from home to work or work to home. Remember, this is only illustrative. We're not saying that the plan should focus in on travel demand management as it relates to people going and coming to work. We just wanted to see what would happen 
if we were able to lop off some of those trips? Is there an advantage to focusing our actions? Now, this, this orange piece in the blue area is, is what uh, represents those work trips in proportion to all the trips everybody takes all day. It's only that small piece of this total trip pie that we reduced by 10%. So we're only reducing trips, a small portion of trips, 10% to see what would happen. How would this change things? When we do that and we stand back and we zoom out at the regional scale, we say, big deal. doesn't matter. It doesn't really affect travel in the off-peak hours or in the peak hours. End of story. Not end of story. Just kidding. If we look at peak travel times, we see something different. It's a little bit better. If you look at that whole six hours of peak travel, a little bit more of a benefit. But we wanted to zoom in even more and look even closer. Just for, uh, as part of that process, let me inform you that most of that peak period travel isn't congested. This is about the portion that's, that's congested. But if you're the person that's in that congestion, as Supervisor O'Leary was on the way to the office yesterday when he got stuck in traffic, it matters. We're not saying that congestion is not an issue. We're just talking about what's the best way to approach it. So if you zoom in at the peak period, just that little part uh, and we, then we zoom further in at only those roads during the peak period that are currently experiencing congestion to see what happens. It's kind of uh, voila. Now it's significant. Now we're seeing a 17% decrease in travel. That tells us that some small changes in travel behavior can make a pretty significant impact. And the biggest part of that is at virtually no cost. So some of the emerging messages and actions. The good news is low cost actions make a difference. The better news yet is that the benefit is where it matters most. And here's the clincher, how it starts to fit together. As the supervisor just told you, the public said they're willing to engage. They specifically said, you know, we'll, we would not just work at home, which everybody would uh, say yes to. They said, yeah, I'd travel a different route or at a different time. So it's telling us a lot about how some of our actions need to go from just transportation planning from a systems perspective and looking at the physical part of it more to the strategic part of it and working with employers and places of high density employment and where there's a lot of people coming and going and looking for opportunities to reduce uh, some of that travel or switch it to a different time of day to make better use of what we have. We're not talking about 51 to 49 percent. We're in the 80 percent 80 category where people are talking about doing something. Another one of our measures is transit ridership, and I'm going to skip that now because uh, Executive Director Tate is going to talk about the Regional Transit Authority in his report. Some of the other measures you'll see in June are here. Bridge condition, export capacity. We'll be looking at things like the environment and stormwater runoff and green cover. We just didn't want to try to inundate you with too many things now. So let me close out here and talk about a couple things in wrapping this up. Remember this circle that we talked to you about before in creating success. We first needed to know the outcomes. Where are we going? We talked with this group specifically about that and spent a whole meeting discussing that. We got 20 pages of ideas from you and we settled on six outcomes. Economic prosperity, I'm not going to list them all, quality infrastructure, etc. Then we came back and we said here are the right measures to, that we need to use to guide, towards, guide us towards the kinds of actions that will lead us to the outcomes. Now we're getting in the action phase and making this creating success model real and making sure that those actions are coming together and leveraging our resources. And we're starting to see the pieces come together in our alignment and actions. Let me give you a couple of examples. When we invest in transit, we fill the glass. We address peak demand. We help improve labor utilization by getting people to jobs. We provide access to some people who don't have any or few choices. We increase income by doing those things, and we attract workers, a lot of the knowledge-based workers that we're trying to attract and keep in the areas of the country and the world that we compete with. Another example is implementing travel demand. Now, we're not saying how to do that yet, but we know now that it makes a difference. So now it's worth spending the time saying, how do we go about doing that? Because it's going to improve our fiscal sustainability. It's cheaper. It's going to tap that public support that we, we see is out there. 
that's going to save money for other needs, and it's going to help us better utilize what we already have. Now, I don't want to close on a downer, but I want to mention that one of the things that you asked us to do was not mask bad news, uh, don't put our head in the sand, you can look at it different ways. One of our principles was we had to fairly and honestly disclose what's going on. And we have to remind you that the funding formula for transportation is completely out of alignment with reality. We're continuing to rely on consumption of gasoline while at the same time we're emphasizing conservation. And the time since we created this slide a couple of years ago when we first started talking about this, the, the federal standards for clean uh, vehicles and lower uh, emission and higher fuel economy vehicles have almost doubled. And if you look at the math, and we'll show you the math in the plan, you're going to be horrified to see how few dollars we're going to have for roads if we can rely on a, a, a gas tax forever. We're eventually going to have to change. And the good news is the public mostly recognizes what we're doing now isn't going to work. So in closing, the best path is not based on one thing. There's various ways to get there. The measures are helping us break the silos. Instead of planning and acting just based on all the water and sewer people talking to themselves and the road people and the environment people, we're now focused on those measures and filling the glass because they cut across all of those outcomes and that broader thinking that we can apply like how do we uh, solve several problems with certain specific actions is starting to emerge. So to recap, we need to look regionally, we need to look close up, and we need to base our actions on what we see in both places. As a regional organization, we can't just stand back there and look at everything on a seven county basis and reach all of our conclusions that way, nor can we just look on the ground because we want to see all those close in idiosyncrasies because we're going to miss a lot because our field of vision is going to be very challenged. We have to remember that we have a lot to be proud of. The glass is half full. We have a system that's doing great performance every day and serving our needs in many, many ways. But the actions that fill the glass are going to position us for greater success. The single most important thing that this organization does, it has control over with respect to this, if you will, um, pardon my use of the control, I don't mean it quite literally, but has the biggest impact on is the transportation plan. It's our major opportunity to help us address these outcomes through these measures by the actions that you adopt in the plan in June. Very quickly, the draft of the complete plan will be available by early May. That's when a formal public comment period will begin. We'd be happy to come to your community. We've been doing, that's only the formal part, for over almost a year. We've been going out to communities, going out to uh, public interest groups, whoever wants us to come out, and we're going to continue to do that and talk about whatever information we have at the time. And we'll have a vote at your next meeting in June. Thank you. Um, that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thanks.